podium here just a second for our uh, next presenter. Okay, that I'll, I'll go on and introduce uh, the commissioner and then we can move it, okay? So Brendan can. So up next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Commissioner Brendan Carr. Uh, commissioner Carr was unanimously confirmed by the Senate just a few months ago, but he's certainly not new to the FCC. He recently served as the commission's general counsel. And I am truly pleased to say that uh, he has always had an open door to meet with and hear uh, concerns of competitive carriers. Uh, we really appreciate that. And Commissioner Carr, we're delighted to have you with us today in what I believe is his first major uh, policy speech since uh, confirmation and being sworn in. So uh, we are, and then he, he was doing du double duty yesterday. He was, spent literally a marathon session on Capitol Hill uh, all five commissioners testifying, and that's uh, one of the reasons why one of the other commissioners couldn't make it yesterday. But uh, we've got to applaud uh, uh, Brendan Carr for uh, uh, taking the, the effort to come out here and join us uh, after a grueling day on Capitol Hill. So uh, please join me in a warm welcome for Brendan Carr. Hey, Brendan, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Great to be here this morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Steve, uh, for that kind introduction, and congratulations to the Competitive Carrier Association on your 25th annual convention. And it has me reflecting 25 years back. And back in 1992, I believe, Steve, that you were serving as chief counsel in the United States Senate, having uh, already spent over a dozen years in senior leadership positions in government, including uh, in the State Department. Uh, for my part, in 1992, I was in eighth grade. Uh, I spent about a dozen years working my way up to that position, so I think we were both peaking at about the same time 25 years ago. But in all seriousness, it's uh, great to join you in Fort Worth. It's terrific to have heard that panel and get to spend some time with those two former governors who have a lot of experience in emergency communication space. Uh, I, I thought it was a real treat to get to hear from them. You know, Texas obviously has a, a rich history of firsts, so I couldn't think of a better venue to give my first speech as an FCC commissioner. For instance, the world's first frozen margarita machine was invented in a restaurant not far from here, uh, so maybe once it gets closer to noon, people can work their way over there and, and check that out. But in more sober and, and probably more relevant firsts, the first microchip was invented in Texas, and the Lone Star State is now, as you know, a hub for 5G research and development. Uh, so whether you call it Silicon Prairie or the Telecom Corridor, much of the state has played and continues to play an important role in the telecom and high-tech industries. So, you know, in preparing for this uh, silver anniversary for CCA, I did some reflecting on how far the wireless industry has come in the past 25 years. If you just think, at the end of 1992, there were 11 million customers, cellular customers in the U.S. Today, that figure is nearly 400 million. In 1992, cellular penetration was less than 5%. Today, as you know, it's over 120%. In 1992, customers used 13.5 billion voice minutes. That sounds like a lot. But last year, the wireless industry totaled 2.75 trillion minutes of use. For those without a calculator handy, that means we're now using, in just two days, the same number of minutes the industry totaled in all of 1992. And of course, this isn't to mention the introduction since then, and now the explosion in data usage. In addition, uh, Steve will probably remember this well, in uh, October 1992, Boys to Men had just released their first album and were on tour. Today, Boys to Men just released another album and are also on tour, so at least we have comfort in knowing some things don't change. <laughs> but enough reflecting on the past, since this is my first official speech, I want to highlight a few of the issues that I intend to focus on during my time on the commission. And I intend for this to be the beginning of the conversation. I welcome all of you, all stakeholders, to reach out to me with ideas on where you think the FCC should be heading. I actually have a lot of confidence about where we are in the Commission and a lot of hope that we are going to fully respect the hard work that CCA and its members do. I know everyone here talks about you all being the engines of economic growth, the engines of opportunity. 
I certainly feel that way. So my door is open to you and your members. Uh, this is probably a good time to you know, recognize, obviously, not just Steve, but Rebecca, the whole crew in DC. They really serve CCA and its members extraordinarily well with their advocacy. So you should be proud of all the work that they're doing on your behalf. You know, before I was given the honor of serving on the commission, I had a hunch that not every great idea emanates from the FCC's eighth floor, which is where the commissioner's offices are. Now that I've been on the job for two months, I can say definitively that they do not. So again, I look forward to hearing your views and getting your feedback as we move forward. And when I think about that future, what stands out to me is the tremendous opportunity we have in tech and telecom to create jobs, to spur investment, and to grow the economy for the benefit of all Americans. It's one of the reasons I'm focused on promoting broadband deployment. Whether it's the workers that manufacture and deploy broadband infrastructure, the app economy that runs over high-speed networks, or the businesses that use these connections to reach customers around the world, broadband can harness the talents of all Americans, creates good-paying jobs, and helps drive our nation's economic growth. I got to see some of this already in my first two months on the job. My first official trip was down to uh, Claremont, North Carolina. There's a plant there that manufactures fiber optic cables. Maybe some of you use them. I toured the plant floor, talked with the highly skilled men and women that operate the machines. When we spur broadband deployment, it starts there. It starts creating jobs here at the infrastructure level. A few weeks later, I visited a satellite manufacturing facility in Sunnyvale, California, uh, where manufacturers are again assembling next generation satellites. These are jobs that we can create when we spur broadband deployment. I've also had the chance to visit with construction crews that are hard at work trenching conduit, pulling fiber, and maintaining the towers needed to deliver high-speed broadband. And I spent time with innovators and entrepreneurs and tech hubs on both coasts that are taking advantage of all this broadband infrastructure to launch new businesses. These experiences only underscore the important role that broadband plays in creating jobs and opportunities for all Americans. So I want to focus my remarks this morning on some of the ways I think the FCC can incentivize even greater broadband deployment. This is particularly important as we make the transition to 5G. As you know, a shift that's going to require a massive investment in both wired and wireless infrastructure. In fact, if we get the right policies in place, this transition could mean $275 billion in network investment, 3 million new jobs, and half a trillion added to the GDP. So how do we get there? How do we ensure the United States wins the global race to 5G. I want to talk this morning about three keys, spectrum, infrastructure, and one we haven't heard a lot about, uh, at least from officials in Washington so far, is ensuring we have the skilled workforce in place to deploy these next-gen networks. And then after that, I'll end by talking more broadly about the need for regulatory reform at the FCC. First, spectrum. We need to get more of it out into the commercial marketplace. And I'm pleased to report the FCC is pressing forward on this front the agency is working hard right now to ensure that wireless providers, including many of, C many of CCA's members, get timely access to the spectrum they recently purchased at our incentive auction. Chairman Pai also announced the commission will be voting to open up additional bands above 24 gigahertz before the year is out. And the FCC has a proceeding underway that's looking at broad swaths of spectrum between 3 and 24 gigahertz. This is a proceeding I'm particularly interested in uh, to see how we can open up some of the bands in there. I think these are all great steps in the right direction. The second key, as I mentioned, to our 5G future is going to be infrastructure. 5G, as you know, is going to require a 10 to 100-fold increase in the number of cell sites in the country. We have right now roughly 300,000. We need to go to over a million in a pretty short order here. I don't think the current regime is tailored to support this type of massive deployment. The regulatory framework in place costs too much. It takes too long. So we need to find ways to drive the unnecessary regulatory costs out of the system, and we need to speed the timeline for obtaining approvals. I've heard from many of you that far too often exorbitant fees, lengthy timelines, are preventing you from deploying next generation networks. That's why I was disappointed to see, for example, that last week the governor of California vetoed a small cell bill that had garnered the support of the state's legislature. This only increases the necessity, I think, for the FCC to take action here. Reforming our infrastructure rules is going to be a top priority of mine. That's why I'm glad to announce that Chairman Pai has asked me to take the lead on the agency's wireless infrastructure proceeding. 
I understand how important infrastructure reform is going to be in terms of maintaining the United States leadership <clears throat> and ensuring that we get ubiqu ubiquitous 5G and other advanced wireless coverage. So I welcome the chance to help lead at the agency on this issue. And I'm happy to report the agency is already making progress. The chairman's authorized me to announce that the commission will be voting next month on the first of a series of orders that's going to streamline the deployment of wireless infrastructure. Specifically, at our next open meeting, the Commission will consider an order that eliminates the need for historic preservation review in cases where providers swap out utility poles that can hold antennas or other wireless communications equipment. As a practical matter, this order is going to go a long way in speeding the regulatory review process as providers seek to update and densify their networks for 5G. The text of this proposed order will be released publicly later today, so all stakeholders will have a chance to review it before we vote on it at the Commission. I'm confident that these and other reforms will make a real difference, including in rural America. In fact, there's one study that's out right now that looks at just some of the regulatory reforms the FCC has already proposed. It shows that if we make these, we can shift the business case for entire communities. We could make it economical for the private sector to deploy 5G to nearly 15 million more homes than under the existing and more burdensome regime. The lion's share of those new cases that are going to be economical for the private sector to invest are going to be in less densely populated areas. So this isn't theoretical in my mind. We can make it, again, profitable just through streamlining for the private sector to invest, and then we can focus on our subsidies and our USF programs uh, in additional, even more hard-to-reach areas. So a lot of this brings me to my third point. We need to make sure that broadband providers have access to the skilled workforce necessary to get this transition across the finish line. Last month, I participated in a roundtable outside of Baltimore, Maryland. It was certainly a wake-up call for me. A broad range of stakeholders from wireless carriers to independent infrastructure providers, they all agreed on one thing. They talked about the shortage of skilled workers that's in place that can actually deploy the small cells, the distributed antenna systems, and other network infrastructure that's key to 5G. Now, while there's no direct regulatory role for the FCC in this, I think we need to focus additional attention on this issue and potential solutions. That includes the role that apprenticeship and other job training programs can play. To that end, I'm going to be participating in an uh, event next month at the Department of Labor on Workforce Development. This is an area that I certainly welcome the input from you all. I want to hear your experiences and ways that the federal government, whether it's the FCC, Department of Labor, or partnerships can do to make sure that you have access to the skilled workforce to actually deploy this massive amount of additional infrastructure. Finally, I want to talk briefly about uh, one other priority of mine, which is regulatory reform. You know, we need to make sure that our regulatory framework promotes competition, innovation, and investment throughout the communications sector rather than imposing heavy-handed and outdated regulations. Back in DC, there's a tendency to pile on just one more regulation, one additional fee, or merely a little more red tape. Far too often, these actions are taken with no consideration for the actual and cumulative burden that these regulations impose, especially on smaller providers. Over the years, the FCC has certainly been no exception. This is particularly true with respect to the agency's reporting and paperwork obligations. For instance, a coalition that represents small and rural broadband providers explained that our reporting obligations alone now consume 23 weeks of work per year. That's five months of full-time labor. Many of the small wireless providers that I've spoken with, including CCA members, they talk about having to take one of their few employees off a customer service job or a marketing effort or even a broadband deployment project, and sit them down and train them in how to complete and submit FCC paperwork. These small businesses are not corporate behemoths. They don't have an army of regulatory lawyers, as you know. They don't have people that can wade through 4,000 pages of the FCC's section of the Code of Federal Regulations. It strikes them, as it does me, that a lot of this paperwork is unnecessary. If we can eliminate these reporting burdens, small businesses can focus even more on competing, growing their businesses, and serving consumers. The small and rural providers in this town certainly understand this, but I want to give an example of just how massive the FCC's reporting and data collection burdens have become. 
According to the Office of Management and Budget, the costs associated with the FCC's current information collections exceed $790 million each year. Now, that's a Texas-sized number and one that's larger than some countries' GDP. I'm confident that the actual number is substantially higher than this official estimate. Having been at the commission now as a, before this job as a staffer for five years, I've seen how these estimates are put together. I don't think that they accurately capture the costs that are being imposed on small businesses. So how do we go about reducing the burdens? The good news, the FCC has already begun to take some much needed steps. At our last two meetings, the commission eliminated or sought comment on eliminating a number of unnecessary paperwork requirements. I was happy to support those efforts. Notably, the decision to eliminate these requirements stem from recommendations the commission received during our biennial review process, which is a time period where the commission is supposed to review all of its rules and eliminate those that are unnecessary. That process has been sort of left to lay fallow the last couple years. But I think the agency's willingness over the last few months to consider the recommendations that are developed there and move quickly on them shows its renewed interest in using that process to identify regulations in need of reform. So I'm asking for your help today in identifying additional ways we can eliminate or streamline unnecessary regulation, whether it's part of that biennial review process or outside of it. I welcome your input. Please take it seriously because I think the commission right now has a commitment to taking it seriously as well. And while I'm confident the FCC is now heading in the right direction, it's clear that we have more work to do to make sure we stay on track and to ensure the public can hold us accountable. I want to propose an idea. I think we should launch a deregulatory dashboard on the Commission's website, and I think this page should do at least two things. First, it should publicly identify the rules the agency has eliminated or streamlined since the beginning of the year. This one-stop page could be a good resource for the public to monitor the progress that we're making in cutting through the red tape. Second, we should include a chart that tracks the burden hours associated with the Commission's reporting and data collection requirements. My expectation is that we'll start to see a trend line that shows the con Commission continuing to bring those burdens down. Now, in terms of timing, the Commission is working, as you may know, on standing up an Office of Economics and Data. And it strikes me that this, is the, this project, this type of deregulatory dashboard, is something that could pair well with that group's effort. So I'd be interested in seeing if the FCC could launch this project soon after the Office gets up and running. Now, in closing, I want to thank, again, CCA for inviting me to join you. I enjoyed the chance to talk about these three key pieces that I see for our 5G future and the need for broader regulatory reform at the FCC. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any ideas that you think will make a difference. I'm happy to hear from you and get those ideas across the finish line. I hope that you all enjoy the rest of this conference. I look forward to a chance to discuss some of these ideas with you. Thank you. Brendan, thank sir. you so very much. Appreciate I really it. appreciate it. Thanks. It has great news on uh, leading the wireless uh, part Thanks. of the infrastructure. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good thank to see you. you. We're going to do a little uh, set change here, just a second. So, uh, again, uh,